Hello, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. We're thrilled to have you join us here. Uh, we were discussing before the program began the duration of this program. Um, we think it's a, maybe five or six years, but the time has gone by very quickly, and we've been uplifted by uh, the poetry that has been presented here. Uh, we appreciate the support of uh, the city of St. Petersburg in making this uh, program available to all. And I am most appreciative of having Helen Pruitt Wallace, the poet laureate of St. Petersburg, uh, as the curator and host of this program. Uh, it is our tradition that before she introduces John Balaban, Sean Sexton, and Sidney Wade, our poets today, that she reads one of her own poems. So, Helen, will you honor us with uh, a verse for today? Thank you. Thank you so much, Hank, and thanks to all of you all for joining us um, for a really terrific program um, that we have in store for you. I'm so delighted and very honored um, to have our three poets uh, this evening. So I will read one short poem, then I'll have the pleasure of introducing um, our poets for tonight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a poem um, because each of these poets do explore the natural world, its darkness, its beauty. Um, I, I've chosen to read a poem that actually is, is set in a location that I know at least a couple, poem, a couple of our poets are familiar with. Um, it's, it's about growing up, going to a little area near the Suwannee River. Um, and it's called Artifacts on Black Lake. And it has an epigraph that goes like this. Memory is a present that never stops passing. Octavio Paz. Remember how Black Lake looked at dusk, plump frogs, the cypress dripping light, the fallen logs bearded with moss. Remember those weekends in the woods, the six of us, a family, floating in a silver canoe, our balance, even then, tenuous. But there, lily pads stretched out their palms, dragonflies tipped their purple wands, and we were safe. Remember how we rooted sandy roads for arrowheads with serrated edges, or pieces of notched and fluted flint. Artifacts exalting what had been, despite their shards. Now gates are rusted, locked, the farm sold, trailer hauled away. Kudzu cloaks the cabbage palm, and what we were, the heft and bulk of us, scatters like the hulls of dried seed. Forgetting finds its own weight to bear. We feel it like we once felt together, pine sap still warm on the bark, a mockingbird's ecstatic summer song, and long gauzy strips of unpaved roads. There, with paper cups of chipped flint, we held tight to what was honed, though broken. Thanks. I have the pleasure tonight um, to introduce three really amazing poets. Um, and the more I've read of their work, the more I'm entranced by the power of their poems. Um, and I and I really mean that. And um, they are poets I've I have read before, but I've never had the pleasure of meeting, except for Sean Sexton, who we did have at the Dali a few years ago. Some of you in our audience may remember Sean if you were if you were in attendance. You absolutely would remember him because he gave a terrific reading um, a few years ago. And I'm going to start off by introducing him tonight. Sean was born in Indian. River County and grew up on his family's treasure hammock ranch. He divides his time between managing a 700 acre cow, calf and seed stock operation, painting and writing. He has kept daily sketch and writing journals since 1973. He's the author of Blood Riding Poems by Anhinga Press, published in 2009. The Empty Tomb, published by the University of Alabama Slash Pine Press in 2014. Descent, published by Yellow Jacket Press, and many, and May Darkness Restore, poems that were uh, published by Press 53 in 2019. 
He's performed at the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering in Elko, Nevada, and also the Miami Book Fair International, the Other World's Literary Conference in Tampa, and the High Road Poetry and Short Fiction Festival in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He received a Florida, International, a Florida Individual Artist Fellowship in 2001. He's a board member of the Laura Riding Jackson Foundation and founding event chair of the annual Poetry and Barbecue held every April, which I hear is great fun. Um, he's also co-founded a Poetry and Organ Advent and Lenten concert series at a community church in Vero Beach, which I've had the pleasure of being part of. Um, um, and he'll be featured in a solo show of ceramics at Flame Tree Clay Gallery in downtown Vero Beach in January 2021. He became the inaugural Poet Laureate of Indian River County in 2016. Please welcome Sean Sexton. Sean, thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. It's a pleasure and it's um, an additional pleasure to, to have uh, two good friends and fabulous poets um, on the docket with me. The, uh, the theme um, that you gave us was self and other. And um, I'm going to touch on it <laughs> to start with and probably depart from it from that moment on. But um, it's, uh, the first is from, uh, from my book, uh, May Darkness Restore, that you mentioned the last hard parts. Someday your last hard parts will be discovered, scratched off a road, dug out of a ditch, held in rock or scattered by the sea. Bits of tooth, knuckle and nail or fragments of a shell, outlasting water and wind, fire and cold, traces of old meanness, arisen from enshrouding bracken like quartz from clay where you last lay and settled among the dust of your little certainties, remains of intransigence, further standing the test of time, evidence you wish couldn't be found of the emptiness in a human heart. And this is disparate. Maybe this is other. The girls in the museum cafeteria titter in pleasant gossip, quaffed and garbed alike in gold, cashmere, and silk. Each face keeps the same joy in this holiday escape from dailiness as their secret society founded upon commiseration excludes a Venus in synthetic leopard wrap, the next table over. Her long raven hair must, as if she'd just stepped from a Baroque bedchamber. She has nothing to say to them, nor do they ask, but sits attending an old blind Tobit and his wife sipping water and taking a frugal repast. Mirandi's love, lonely bottles hang in the gallery upstairs, paintings in lush pink butter and almond paste, and the most exquisite grays in art. On a wall placard is a quote from his ending days. If only you knew, Longy, how badly I want to work. I have so many ideas I wish to develop. In quiet and solitude, he kept at his metier sharing the family apartment with his three unmarried sisters, seeking only the recognition of his peers, the leering Chardin, rag tied around his bespectacled head, stolid Piero, mercurial Caravaggio, and the intractable, enraptured Cezanne. I'm going to read a, a poem that I, I might refer, refer to later, uh, also in the book, uh, called The Barren Heifer. Today is the day, the last crimson dawn for the barren heifer, a truck to the abattoir soon to arrive. Half a year she stayed up to her withers in feast in the set-aside 
pasture with orphans, errant bulls, a rickety cow and others on last legs. We drove her with an ancient blind dam who knew the gate, stored them together overnight in the pens to keep her blood quiet. She has no light, no soil within to plant. Dinner by dinner, we'll send her to heaven, our bellies her path one way or another. This is um, a poem called The Hillside Equipment Auction Yard Outside Dothan, Alabama. And uh, on a trip to um, Tuscaloosa to read at Patty White's um, Slash Pine Press Festival, uh, we, we passed this coming and going. And uh, it haunted me for quite a while. I, I was, wasn't able to, to write this poem for a while. I wanted to make it a swords into plowshares kind of poem. And uh, this COVID condition that we're in has, has managed to um, enable me to, to uh, revisit things that are five, 10, 15 years old. This is one of them and it, it came to me. The, uh, the epigraph is, I saw this on a bumper sticker driving around Alabama on a truck. We saw it uh, passing. The, bump, the uh, epigraph is, I'm the wretch the song's about. A soft breeze mingles in the teeth of an ancient harrow set beside stacked stock panels and piles of rusted field fence falters upon a mass of engine blocks submerged in bisqueen like boulders in a hard flowing mountain stream as a frozen silence pervades the iron redoubts of the hillside equipment auction yard. There is a forlorn pause among disparate machines, hauled, driven, or dragged into places they seem remaindered from a wayward carnival in all its trappings. Odors of fresh paint and grease confuse the apparition they comprise, cast from distant fields into glittering rows, as stood the Spartan army among the dunes in early morning light awaiting the trumpet toll. For sale on the morrow, the sign says, tractors of every make and model, dozers, loaders, graders, backhoes, and excavators, and spread beyond their imaginary power upon the compound in dissension like the social ordering of a small town cemetery, the accessory dreams of agricultural invention, combines and balers, buckets and spreaders. Adam's cure, nearly nonsensical in the problems of its fashioning, monuments to simple, ugly hope. And you pass by, imagine yourself traversing the aisles, searching at first your own emptiness for what isn't there. Wanton remembrance arises in bruised knuckle disdain of the relic grain drill with jammed seed tubes, frozen bearings and missing or broken springs, 20 years out of calibration calling to you like the sirens from the rocks and suddenly 18 small birds pass overhead in perfect formation, outpacing the movement of the air. Mindlessly, you take them in. How they seem to know better than you where they should be going as they fly by. You're still 800 miles from home, full of certain allure, of things you were never meant to have. Thankful to know you'll miss the auction any auction by sheer gravity of departure, leaving it all behind to sons of men, the dream-laden, addled, miserly, speculative, and outright fools, yea, the fools, or everyone starves. But you hurry along safely on your way, knowing they will appear tomorrow evening at the appointed hour, 
neighbors a thousand miles away, all little less than gods, their lands little more than graves. I referred to, um, to the Heifer poem and wrote um, much later this one called Eating the Heifer, uh, dedicated to John. <laughs> Eating the Heifer, heart, tripe, tongue, the brown liver and kidneys grown and picked from her dark garden like varieties of fruit. Striped, pebbled, and squared stacks of knuckle and rib. Tail come shrink-wrapped and quick-frozen by the abattoir as if they devised her into large pieces of candy. And the unblinking eye after eye of bone and penumbras of flesh sectioned like saw logs with guardian halos of fat, seemly atmospheres of a fresh sliced planet. There was all her fear in our teeth, toughness they couldn't kill, sent home in six coolers. Her inbred anxiety shot through at the end, redeemed for chewing, and how she balked at every gate we set for her like malicious gods. Only the liver, marrow, and sweetbreads, and the autonomic heart remain pliant, sovereign from harm, tender as forgiveness. We take her in, savoring every part, bisques, roast, tartar, jerks and grinds, sop her juices like spring milk from mountainside seeps, soaking attendant carrots, spuds, and onions, as easily she joins back to the roots of creation, becomes medicine, nourishment, our peace and succor. Midwife made of meat, she births us backward through hunger, her last poem spoken every swallow, as she increases and grows in us, very things we devour, chine and cartilage, blood and cell, there is no greater magic in the world than this, to chew of her, the forbs, legumes, and delicacies her mother taught her in the bright morning. The shades sweeten greensward, masticate the light, imbibe the rain, smell the evening mist rising from the cauldron as she steams and softens in the kitchen air and listen to her singing to the fire from the great arias of the earth's original music born of this world, making again into something new. I think I've used my time. And uh, it's so lovely to be with you all. I, um, I can't say enough of how, how wonderful it is. Thank you. Sean, thank you. Thank you, Sean, for that wonderful reading. Wow, such so many powerful poems, and, and it brings me back to the day that I was at your ranch and, and saw your cattle. And um, anyway, that was that was terrific. I appreciate it. I'm going to now introduce Sydney Wade. Um, Sydney is a poet, professor, and translator, and her eighth collection of poems, Deep Gossip: New and Selected Poems, was published by John Hopkins University Press in April 2020. She taught workshops on poetry and translation at the University of Florida's MFA program for 23 years, and she served as, as the president of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs. She's also been the poetry editor for the journal um, Subtropics for many years, and her poems and translations have appeared in a wide variety of journals, including Poetry, The New Yorker, Grand Street, The Paris Review, and many other um, literary publications. The Poetry Foundation website says her work is known for its elegant wordplay and interest in beauty and the sublime. 
Jordan Davis and Slate called Wade's imagination, quote, as powerful as any American poet since Wallace Stevens, noting that her poems always yield to paraphrase, pointing to something recognizable in the real world or the news. Her project to remain sane despite the gloom these words point to requires that she reassure, reassure herself and the reader that while, while we really are seeing what we're seeing, the constellations of light and love still exist. And we all need to be reassured of that right now. So thank you, um, Sydney, for being with us and welcome. Thank you so much, Helen. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you all. I've so long admired John, uh, John's work and his translations and, um, and uh, Sean is a very dear friend and I too have been at his wonderful ranch. I, I hope you get the chance, John, at some point. <laughs> um, uh, thank you to the Dali Museum for this, for this platform. Um, I'm gonna read from, from the new and selected, uh, the Deep Gossip book. Um, I'm gonna start, a landscape uh, has always been, as you mentioned, um, a very powerful uh, influence on me and I uh, started writing mostly about that and then became a birder and started writing about birds. <laughs> so um, this, uh, my family has a home in, uh, uh, in Kansas. Uh, it's the old family homestead, which we repair to um, every year, except for this past one, uh, for, a, for a respite. Um, and this poem is, is called The Combine. It is uh, modeled on um, Elizabeth Bishop's The Moose. The Combine, through acres of wheat with heavy heads, fields of hay and oats, alfalfa, green and low, on one of the dirt roads that travels straight east and west, or north and south, curving seldom from these straightforward axes, over slowly rolling hills, through an occasional pasture, over a few curling creeks crowded with trees, we're driving to a shower celebrating the engagement of a second cousin. The wind is blowing. The sun is shining. We called him Straight Pete Nelson, Grandmother says from the back seat of the car. We've passed his old homestead, and she's peering out the back window at the abandoned pile of dressed yellow limestone that once was a home. He'd stand at the ends of his rows and stare down each one as if his life depended on their being straight as blazes. Hmm. Did you know, Aunt Thelma, Isabella, that Emerald Nyquist has taken to drink? Oh, my. The small amazement at a world not thoroughly correct. On the right, the isolated but well-maintained cemetery of the renegade Mission Devout, broken from the Lutheran body many years ago, a civil war of minor proportions. A handsome headstone guards the Damker plot, two large markers and four small ones, all the children carried off by whooping cough in one unspeakable stroke. A single meadowlark sits and preens on a leaning post rock, on past fields littered with small square and big round bales of fodder. Yes, they say he locked his wife in the basement, then prayed for her resurrection. A pheasant trots across an unkempt plot. Here weeds prevail. We change direction at the goldenrod elevator, a solitary metal structure hunkered down beside the railroad tracks. The complexion of the noonday fields is metallic, a weather-beaten grain glanced at by the sun. The motion of the wheat, in high relief and golden as can be imagined, is heady, oceanic. We fall silent, lulled by the roll of the land, the hum of the motor. Now, as we top a modest rise, we see a combine in a far field. Harvest has begun, and a single figure sits high as a lookout on his rust-colored machine, small and angular in the distance. Without veering from an imaginary line, he works his way slowly toward the center, guiding the stately vessel around the selvages of the field, felling wheat in a wide wake behind him. I lived for two years in um, Istanbul and uh, was deeply uh, influenced by um, my surroundings there. Um, this poem is called Byzantium, which of course is the ancient name of uh, 
what later became Constantinople and then, and then Istanbul. Early summer, Istanbul. The light is green and sweet and pale. Dark fairies slice the morning's veils. On leafy greengrocer Byram Street, hunch mountains made of artichokes. Fish shine in rings on blazing trays, and the volume of the vendor's calls gains weight as traffic circulates. Copper is shaped with rhythmic strokes in crabbed streets where in older days the golden insects of Apollonius sang like brazen parakeets. A literary critic flew to Istanbul once to pursue some literary notions, Ray, the rectitude of Constantine, the triumph of the Western line. The cocksure fellow never sailed the ferries that continued to cross the waters of the Bosphorus. He had a headache, I believe. He dreamed a nightmare, then pronounced all of Asia squat and foul and rode his line straight out of town to calm his nerves in Athens, Greece. He missed the boat entirely. East and west, the interplay of form and soul, of gold and dark, of Greek and of the Abbasid, the Persian and the Byzantine, find incessant synthesis on the shoulders of the Bosphorus, whose waters serve to both unite and separate two continents as autumn runs and shines between the banks of heat and winter's scrim. Snow on the ground, heavy and wet, Sheets of light shroud hulking mosques. Fairies now glide in and out of blinding fog with two lights grim ablaze on each black dreaming mast. Soul here sails the what has been, its contrast and complexity, shifting images that correspond to starlit domes of hierarchs, to tankers in the churning sea. While there in uh, Turkey, I um, traveled around the country and visited a, an ancient uh, ruin called Termesos. Um, it's in the southern mountains of Turkey. Um, uh, the place is so um, um, hard to get to. It's way, way up a very steep mountain. It's a miracle that they managed to build these beautiful um, buildings that have withstood uh, some of them, numerous earthquakes, thousands of years um, it was so out of out of the way that um, um, Alexander the Great decided not even to bother trying to conquer it it was it was too hard um, I was reading um, John's spectacular poem about um, the Acropolis and this reminded that reminded me of, of this particular spot Termesos from ashlar blocks cool to the hand, from the passionately accurate spaces between them, from cisterns brimming with desiccated comment, from the herd but invisible snake in the brush, rise the word walls of a ruined city. Wait, they seem to be saying, wait. They have waited through mountainous declensions of time, through bronze panels of sunlight that transfigure the fall and lisping snows and the engorgements of spring. Wait, they say in the dialect of stones that converses with surge and the moving earth. There is work to be done. There are, there are cores to mine. There is a future here of geometrical purity if you just take the time to analyze the lines and to scrape and examine the speech pot freezes. Wait, they repeat, and I navigate a cleft with the feet and the heart and the desire to believe in this stone-born imperative and its constellations of lichen that testify there is no less diminishing. There is only the organic work of translation. Um, I wrote this next poem um, in great discomfort after the first non-election of George Bush. <laughs> Um, and it felt like, um, as the country is today, the, uh, uh, just utterly divided right down the middle, almost like a stroke patient whose right side does not, does not recognize the left. Um, it's called a sonnet called No Comfort to Be Had. After it happened, the blood pressure soared. Half the body wept, one hand on its brow, while one of its two legs began to march to the drum of that which had prevailed. 
One half of the brain, bewildered, racked itself in search of comfort, while the other, firmer half, scoured the mall for a gown for the ball. The body, thus arrayed in perfect discord, one foot crammed in a party shoe, now began to stagger around the room, starched and wilted all at once. One eye, the pale one, stared at the clock ticking on the shelf, whose face concealed a belly full of worms. One hand nailed the orders to the wall. Um, this next poem is about a geep. Um, I don't think many people have heard of a geep, but it is a real thing. It's a, a genetically engineered creature um, made out of the, uh, the genes of both a goat and a sheep, thus geep. I refer in the poem to Michael, who was my office mate at the time, Michael Hoffman, who was a, a good friend and a wonderful poet, geep. The music of the sleepy day was ravagingly dull until Michael reeled up a geep from the depths of his considerable intelligence. A geep, a wonky blend of goat and sheep, a medical medley, genetic fugue, they call chimera, another holy enthralling sound we found when Googling geep, whose enharmonic bleating in the end rings oh so sad. The photo on the screen reveals a downcast baby creature neither here nor there, two bold and mordant sets of chromosomes whistling fortissimo through its patchwork hide, a botched up map of silken hair and woolly yellow fur, its forlorn droopy ears a study in radical embarrassment. I feel profoundly sorry for this border folly, this lonely little instrument of the ever-expanding notion of what's possible, but then I see we're kin, the little geek and me, were marginal ephemera intoning low invisible messages at the edges of the known to who knows whom, the difference between us a matter of a degree. The poet, of course, a hybrid creature of transport and remorse, an overreacher in semaphore who knows that sounds the gold in the ore, whose pleasure ground is linguistic welter that rides like ice on its own melting to paradise or to a stranger land we don't yet understand. Those of you who know Frost's wonderful, Robert Frost's wonderful essay, The, po the Figure a Poem Makes, will recognize the wholesale theft um, <laughs> involved in that last little, little sonnet. Okay. Um, I found a, a quotation somewhere, I don't even remember where, that it was arresting. It's called, Human Food Consists Entirely of Souls. And this apparently was said by an Inuit hunter to a Danish ethnologist um, in 1921. On my, kitchen on my kitchen shelves, large mason jars are stuffed with the white, gray, and buff bodies of former selves I pulled from the moss duff in which they thrived. Porcini, bolitas, lively fruit that flourished in the rough of the forest floor, but who now lie stiff and dried and tough, entombed in glass so I may savor the flavor of mortal slough. Skin the living bag we live in, unfurred, unfeathered, bare to the air, crusted and weathered by time, by fear, first to parse the grammar of lust or wasting, sack of blood and fluid, when breached will we'll flood or weep, as mother's legs wept, she lay naked, shaved, bedbound and drowning in her body's watery conjugations of the verb to die, she declined in spirit, she swelled in form, betrayed by the welter of assaults on her frame. She called on God to come get her great beached weight. She prayed, her dear eyes wrecked, confounded by the grave declensions of earthbound flesh. Um, I'll end on two short poems um, about Birdie. 
birding at the Hamilton County phosphate mines. Uh, birders go to very strange places to seek out birds, but we go where the birds are, so this is one of them. The plunder of the vast pine woods has sundered Earth's live crust from rock. The earth has been stripped and flayed, and great white mounds of chalky phosphogypsum loom giant poisonous breasts over milky waste clay ponds. Here thousands and thousands of birds perch and swim, dabble, soar, and dive. Hawk, duck, stork, sora, and hinga, sparrow, wren, all thrive in this humming mess. Sorrow yields to dubious wonder at the fecund blousy zen. And finally, birding at the dairy. We often go to a very large and noisy uh, agricultural dairy associated with the University of Florida, but the birds are there too. We're searching for the single yellow-headed blackbird we've heard commingles with thousands of starlings and brown-headed cowbirds when the many-headed body arises and undulates, a sudden congress of wings in a maneuvering wave that veers and wheels, a fleet and schooling swarm in synchronous alarm, a bloom radiating in ribbons, in sheets, in waterfall, a murmuration of birds that turns liquid in air that whooshes like waves on the shore, or the breath of a great seething prayer. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Sydney. Thank you so much. So I have a question. Did you say that one can still find a geep? Are they actually out there? Um, a, what, at least one existed. It has to be engineered. Um, it, it, it doesn't come naturally. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a little reassuring. <laughs> yeah. So. I guess, yeah. Oh, that was a wonderful, a wonderful reading, and I enjoy the, the wordplay just thank so you. very much. So thank you. Um, next, I have the pleasure to introduce John Balaban. John is the author of 13 books of poetry and prose, including four volumes, which together have won the Academy of the I'm sorry, the Academy of American Poets Jane Laughlin Award a National Poetry Series selection, and two nominations for the National Book Award. His book, Locusts at the Edge of Summer, New and Selected Poems, won the 1998 William Carlos Williams Prize from the Poetry Society of America. In 2003, he was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship, and in 2005, he was a judge for the National Book Awards. Balaban served as a conscientious objector during the war in Vietnam, and in addition to writing poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, he's a translator of Vietnamese poetry and also the past president of the American Literary Translators Association. In 1999, with two Vietnamese friends, he founded the Vietnamese Nam Preservation Foundation. <coughs> Excuse me. And in 2008, he was awarded a medal from Vietnam's Ministry of Culture for his poetry translations, and his leadership in the restoration of the ancient text collection at the National Library. So, so interesting. Uh, welcome, John. So happy you could be here with us for the Dolly Poetry Series. Happy to be here with you and Sydney and my friend Sean. Um, you have a topic, and I'm, I have one poem in the batch I'll read uh, now about self and others, because it's... Uh, something that given the pandemic is with us all, the sense of utter loneliness we have and disconnection from others. Uh, it starts with an epigraph uh, from a Trent Reznor, uh, Reznor poem, song actually, sung by Johnny Cash. The poem is called The Goodbyes. And the epigraph is, what have I become my sweetest friend? Everyone I know goes away in the end. Our last farewells may come as a surprise, whether we made our preparations or never bothered. For some, it's au revoir. For others, just goodbye. 
or oops, or even no, but still a final moment of me. Losing others goes on longer, both the dead and alive, who we will never see again but in dream or memory. Whisper their names into your pillow at bedtime. Say them all you want, you are calling after ghosts. Dead parents, good or bad, dwelling in terminal silence. Exes living in Ohio with someone you've never met. Past lovers, old friends, poems you had, last replies, lips you kissed, would kiss again. Children grown and gone. This is our harder trial. These are bleakest times. Not our own going, but the going of others. And I lived, we lived in Miami for eight years or so, and I loaned a book of poetry uh, of translation, Sydney, uh, that uh, translations of Anak Matava, and um, somehow it got left out uh, on a bench. And you know the air in Miami, it's salty and sort of, I retrieved it and it wasn't quite as good shape as when I had left it to a friend. Uh, so the book, uh, the, po the poem is called Anna Agmatova uh, Spends the Night on Miami Beach. <laughs> well, her book anyway. The Kunitz volume left lying on a bench, the pages a bit puffy by morning flush with dew, riffled by sea breeze, scratchy with sand, and the paperback, the paperback with a 1930s photo showing her in spangled caftan, its back cover calling her the star of the St. Petersburg circle of Pasternak, Mandelstam, and Bloch, surviving the revolution and two world wars. So she'd been through worse. The months outside of La Fortovo prison, waiting for a son who is already dead. Watching women stagger and reel with news of executions. One mother asking, can you write about this? Akmatova thinking, then answering, yes. If music lured her off the sandy bench to the clubs where men were kissing, Lutre would have not concerned her much, nor the vamps sashing in leather. Decadence amid Art Deco fit nicely with her black dress, chopped hair, Chanel cap. What killed her was the talk, the empty eyes which made her long for the one person in 10,000 who could say her name, who could take her home, giving her a place between Auden and Apollinaire to whom she could describe her night's excursion amid the loud hilarities, the consuming hungers arriving towards the end of the American era. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> My wife and little daughter and I arrived in Miami uh, just a few weeks for uh, before Hurricane Andrew, you remember that? So, um, and, <laughs> and the whole place was wrecked. Of course, we were safe, but we had to dig ourselves out literally just to get out of the building. Uh, so many trees came down on the house. Uh, but we had a wonderful friend uh, I had known through Sydney through translation, uh, Elling I, the great translator of uh, Lee Paul. Chinese translator, but also a great botanist uh, whose family had settled uh, near Sarasota, right out of Sarasota, on 100 acres around the turn of the century before last. And um, Elling and I started talking through translation and we became great friends. And when uh, the hurricane was over and the roads opened up, he was the first person to come visit us as you'll see in the poem I'm about to read. After the hurricane. Near dawn, our old live oak sagged over, crashed on the tool shed, shed, rocketing off rakes, paint cans, flower pots. Rain slashed the shutters all night until it quit, 
they arrived in queer light, silence, and ozoned air. Then voices calling as neighbors crept out to see the snap trees, leaf mash, and lawn chairs driven in heaps with roof bits, siding, sodden birds, dead snakes. For days, army cranes clanked by our house in sickening August heat as bulldozers scraped the rotting tonnage from the streets. <clears throat> then our old friend, Elling drove over from Sarasota in his old VW van packed with candles, with dog food, cat food, flashlights, and batteries. Jugs of water, a frozen cake, crackers, and caviar. A case of Tsingtao beer, some chainsaw blades, and tropical trees to plant the place again. Five years later, the Ylang Ylang rises 30 feet, unfurling long yellow blossoms to fill our evenings with Athens of Chanel. And so it goes with the Pichardia palms, the gumbo limbo, Cuban guanabana, papaya, bananas, and bamboo. Now the house is shaded, overhung with bougainvillea, trellised and passion flower, scented by gardenia, by Burmese orchids that drink our humid air, offering each its reply to wreckage. There's a poem that I wasn't sure I'd read, but I will. <clears throat> Ibn Fadlan, do you know the Arab uh, journeyer into uh, they're on the 10th century. Well, in 922 AD, he sent a message back to the, uh, the ruler, the caliph of the period, uh, describing a trip he had made where he'd seen uh, um, Westerners on the river, Volga, Volga, Volga River. Uh, and he came to a conclusion about our world at that time when his world was so well, you'll see that poem. Ibn Fadlan, the Arab emissary, encounters Vikings on the Volga River in 922 AD. The Rus, as they are called, camped above the river, trading furs from a log hall axed out by slaves. The men, tall as date palms, blonde, tattooed, had set a pole out front, carved with gods to which they offer things to bless their trade. This was all I saw of their piety or conscience. Caliph, they are the dirtiest creatures of God. Each morning, when the men stir out of sleep, a slave girl brings a bronze ablution bowl, first to the chief who washes his face, then rinses his mouth, spits, and blows his nose into the bowl, which he carries around until each is washed in the same filthy water. When their lord died, a huge Sahira Dachma, the witch, who rules the slave girls, set them wailing as they packed his corpse in black earth, and his men built a death ship with a funeral pyre. They call this witch Angel of Death, Malak Amwak. They picked a girl to go with the dead lord, then invited men to fornicate with the slave girl, drugged and lost in crazy songs. The girl was led to the ship where the Lord, his corpse and I wash, lay on the pyre wreathed in flowers and fruit. The woman then stabbed the girl in her ribs. As a man crept behind her with a knotted rope, strangling her cries until she fell dead, and they laid her on the pyre. Torching the ship, knocking away its blocks, they shoved it blazing into the river singing their Lord to a life of pleasures they imagine. Soon his ship was ashes swirling on the currents. O oh, Caliph, through forested lands, west and north, one finds only infidels with vile habits. Some are Christian. Nothing will come of them. This last book uh, that came out just last September to 
be greeted by the pandemic virus in a few months is called um, Empires. And the cover, Sydney, is probably from that mountain area that you were reading about, Nemrut Dash, uh, where there are incredible statues uh, on those mountainsides carved. Uh, I have time for two poems. Yeah. This is called After the Inauguration 2013, to take us back to a sore topic of inaugurations. Um, but it has an epigraph that sets the tone, I think. It's from uh, the Epistle to the Hebrews, 922. Without the shedding of blood, I better take a drink or something. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Pulling from the tunnel at Union Station, our train shunts past DC officers and then crosses the rail bridge over the tidal Potomac, blooming in sweeps of sunlight. Except for me and two young guys in suits studying spreadsheets on their laptops and the tattooed girl curled asleep across two seats and the coiffed blonde lady confined to her wheelchair up front next to piled luggage. It's mostly black folk, some trickling home in high spirits, bits of inaugural bunning and patriotic ribbons swaying from their suitcase handles on the overhead racks, all of us riding the Carolinian South. <clears throat> Further on, where it's suddenly sailboats and gulls on a nook of the Chesapeake, the banked up rail bed cuts through miles of swamp pines and cypress as the train trundles past the odd hern, stoking frogs, stalking frogs, or picking up speed clatters through open cornfields where for a few seconds, staring through the dirty glass, you can spot turkeys scrabbling the stubble. Further south, past Richmond, something like snow or frost glints off a field and you realize it's just been gleaned of cotton. And this is indeed the south. As if to confirm this fact to all of us on Amtrak, some latter-day Confederate has raised the rebel battle flag in a field of winter wheat. At dusk, just outside of Raleigh, the train slows and whistles three sharp calls at a crossing in Kittrell, North Carolina. Along the railroad tracks, under dark cedars, like graves of Confederates from Petersburg's nine-month siege, men who survived neither battle nor makeshift hospital at the Kittrell Springs Hotel, long gone from the town, where our train now pauses for something up ahead. Nearby in Oxford in 1970, a black soldier was shot to death. One of his killers testified, he committed suicide, coming in here wanting the four letter word, my daughter-in-law. Black vets just back from Vietnam set the town on fire. Off in the night, you could see the flames from these rails that once freighted cotton, slaves, and armies. And now our Amtrak speeds by, passengers chatting or snoozing or just looking up as we flip past the shutdown mills, shotgun shacks, collapsed tobacco barns in the evening fields with their white chapels, where the blood done sign my name is still sung, where the past hovers like smoke or a train whistle's call. This is a short poem, one last one. Christmas Eve at Washington's Crossing out on the freezing Delaware, ice sheets bob the surface, breaking against granite pilings of the Colonial River Inn, swept by winter storm. Gusts of snow blow off a sandbar and sink in plunging currents, where a line of ducks paddle hard against the blizzard. 
as cornfields on the Jersey banks are whisked into bits of stalks and broken sheaves spinning in the squalls. This is where one such Christmas night, the tall courtly general with bad teeth risked his neck and his revels to cross the storming river and rout the Hessians. What made them think they could succeed? Farmers, mostly, leaving homesteads to load cannon into Durham boats, to row into the snowstorm, then march all night to Trenton, saving the Republic for Valley Forge and victory at Yorktown. Before crossing, the legend says, they assembled in the snow to hear Payne's new essay about summer soldiers and sunshine patriots. What words would call us all together now? On what riverbank? For what common good would we abandon all? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> wow, it's a powerful poem to, to end on. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, John. And that concludes the poetry reading part of our um, program. You guys were all terrific. We will segue in just a minute um, to our Q&A. But before we do, I want to do a shout out um, to Alsace Valentine and Tom Blow Books, where I'm hoping um, all of you who are watching our program um, will make your way to tombelow.com um, and buy these poets' books. Um, you can um, get their books there from Alsace. She can order them and ship them to you. Um, and if you don't know of that bookstore, you need to, because it's a, it's a fabulous and indie store that's um, really doing great right here in downtown St. Pete. So please um, check it out and, and buy these books from these amazing, amazing poets. Um, so so let's, let's now just take a few minutes and, um, and chat. Let's talk about poems. Um, I will start us off. I have a question maybe for, for all of you, and, and I'm hoping that maybe you have a couple questions for each other. Um, I'm interested, it, it seems to me, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of your, um, your wonderful line, the reply to wreckage. John, I think I've got that, that right. I wonder if you can talk about how um, the, the role of poetry um, as well, and this is pretty broad, I know, the role of poetry, but also the sort of the role of the natural world. All of you write a lot about the natural world without romanticizing it, I might add. And I love that about your work. Um, you all do that. Um, but, but could you talk a little bit about the role of poetry, the role of language, um, and what the natural world provides as, um, as, as John calls, a reply to wreckage? How, how does language, how does the natural world help us deal with what so many of us right now are very, very dark days. Um, well, us off with that? I, was I was wondering what your question might be. And so I, I, I dug out a, a poem that I've read since college. W.H. Uh, Owens in memory of W.B. Yeats, right? And he, he has that disturbing passage where he says, uh, poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper, flows on south and so on. And then he says at the end of that passage, after saying it makes nothing happen and apparently diminishing it, he says, it survives a way of happening a mouth. And what that d suggests is that in the usual lonely silence that we live in day to day, and met, perhaps which we feel even more, in special times like the one we're in right now, uh, a, a chilling loneliness, and it's uh, there seems to be no way out of it. Uh, sometimes the, the right words will come in the right way, and uh, poetry can do that and take us out of our misery and envision a happier place. And it may be that the natural world for all of us is important because that place is steady in its beauty and encouragement to the degree that we don't and mess it up ourselves. But Sydney, you have us, you're shaking your head, so I know you have something to say. <laughs> yeah, I, um, the natural world is always a bomb, um, B-A-L-M, um, yeah. to me, because um, there are very few people out there. <laughs> 
it's a refuge, but but it too is um, is a desperate place. Um, the more the more I've learned about, the more I've watched and learned about birds, the more I, I discover how vicious um, nature nature can be and is all the time. Um, so um, it's I, I think it's a matter of translation, basically. Um, uh, one translates what one sees. And uh, Sean had a really wonderful line in one of his poems called Vision, where he wonders, how do we come to see what we see? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so many of his poems are filled with catalogs of, uh, of, of, of things, of, of um, natural things, uh, man-made things, objects that we use that, and, have, and disuse. Um, and uh, he seems to be uh, insisting that, that we look at them in the same way that he does. Um, and that, to me, is a is a is a way of translating one's consciousness um, um, using using the details, the implements of of the everyday or the natural world. Yeah. The landscape for me um, is is indeed a refuge. This morning, my son and I were crossing a field uh, to make sure the heifers were all. We're all uh, had calved safely, and uh, there was nothing going on. And it was so funny on that very subject of vision. Uh, we saw, uh, we wondered. There were there was sort of a bright uh, silver passage in the trees in the distance, and um, I said to my son, uh, "Either that's just the way the light is falling on those trunks right now, or that's a Brahmin heifer all." all uh, heaped up and having trouble calving. And we had to cross the field to be sure. And it was just a flare of light. It was just the way the light was acting. Uh, it was as if, although I've been here 65 years, it was as if the, it was the first time I'd seen that. And, uh, uh, you know, all of those things are, they're things of great, uh, solace in one sense and and great concern in in another and uh so it's a difficult place to uh to completely let your hair down you know you, you do have to uh you do have to worry about things being the steward i i love that um I love that image, Sean, and I think, I can't remember the name of the poem, but I believe you have an image very much like that in one of your poems um, about, uh, about that light and then discovering that it's actually a, a, a calf or, yeah, it's, it's a terrific image. So, yeah. And I'm also, I'm also struck, John, when you talked about um, poetry as, as sort of helping negotiate that, that darkness, I'm, I'm, what comes to mind for me is not only the reading of poetry and its ability to to bring us together in the in the power of the words, but but then also as poets, um, the the writing of poetry um, and and how that can also help um, deal with the darkness of the world, just because it does um, something about the creative act itself. Um, it creates a new space for us to deal with some of the darkness. And, and I like thinking of poetry just both in terms as the, of the reader as well as then the, the poet and, um, and how we deal with some of, the, some of those dark days. Um, what, what questions might you have for each other? I've got others if you don't have any, but. Um, I wanted to ask John um, how his, uh, his translation uh, work has affected his own work. I get asked that all the time, and I don't, I don't have a very good answer for that. <laughs> but I'd like to know what John thinks. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, I, you know, I translated poetry mostly from Vietnamese, right? I've done some others, but perhaps I knew most about the um, prosody, the metrics, the history, the tradition of those uh, two cultures, one highly literary derived from China, the other a uh, folk tradition equally int intricate and, and subtle, um, but sung out loud by people who couldn't read or write. 
that latter poetry, the folk poetry, um, was reassuring of my own early beliefs in imagist poetry because it, it hardly has any flat out declarations or statements or pieces of advice, uh, but it makes all of its uh, arguments to the reader uh, from pictures from the real world that are very natural, that belong into the countryside, of people who grow rice for a living for the most part. And then correspondingly, the uh, highly formal poetry based on the Chinese uh, Lusher regulated verse form, where every poem is eight lines long, seven syllables to a line, rhymes in the first, second, fourth, sixth, and so on. Uh, th that sort of reignited my own awareness and memory of uh, this, the tradition of English poetry that I had grown up on. So I think when you start translating something outside of yourself, in a different culture, you learn about yourself in the culture that you grow up in. You grew up in yourself. And uh, maybe they do something good for each other. I think I've only tried to make one or two poems where I took uh, Vietnamese metrics and structure and put it into an English poem just to see if it... Once I was stuck at an airport, it had no lights on the field. It was on an island in, in uh, the ocean or the Gulf of Siam. And so I was just doodling, waiting, and I uh, wrote a poem that way. That was very fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You yourself, Sydney. I, I remember reading something, an introduction about you somewhere, where um, you were talking about teaching and what you got from teaching students, and then you talked about uh, the hard work of writing poems. But then those uh, special moments where one comes breaking through, and it just is wonderful. But what did you say exactly? Do you remember it? that um, I'm trying to remember? No, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was, I remember uh, the joy. I remember feeling intensely sorry for people who, who couldn't do what we do when, when we're in that moment. But it must be like, you know, an athlete who is, as they say, in the zone, you know, just performing flawlessly. Mm. Um, and it's... Um, it's a way out of yourself. I mean, it's, it's, you're expressing yourself, but you're also above and outside of yourself at the same time. And it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful feeling. And <laughs> um, I, it's only happened you know, to me a few times, but um, when it does, it, 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 it's magic. Um, Back to the issue of, of translation, um, I love I love how you phrased that about how you um, you learn about yourself and your own culture um, through studying the the cultures of others. Um, one thing I, I used to love teaching the translation of poetry because um, that is an exercise in pure craft. You know the the ego is not involved. It's it's a it's a problem solving um, exercise, and um, it it attunes the ear. Um, it attunes the eye. I think I think every poet should should give it a go at some point, um, because in terms of craft, uh, it it makes you aware um, more than any other act. I think of of um, what writing poetry is all about. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Sean, do you have a question you might like to ask um, Sydney and John or? Uh, well, I know that both, both um, Sydney and John um, uh, visit uh, form. I've, I've seen form in, in, uh, each of their their books, their many books, and uh, and so uh, and other, you know, every other kind of uh, poetry writing as well, free verse, uh, etc. And uh, and so maybe just a comment on that: how important uh, sometimes to uh, find form for uh, an idea 
or if the idea and the form come uh, hand in hand when they when they do that when they write in in forms sonnets etc. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I was going to say that the Helen has a wonderful. Uh, what was that poem I was I was reading the other day? It's a villanelle, isn't it? That I was remembering of yours. You you asked me about a poem that you very kindly asked me about a poem that I wrote um, that was after Elizabeth Bishop's poem One Art. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a villanelle. I love villanelles. Yeah. They're hard, <laughs> but, uh, and I'm not good at them, but I do enjoy playing around with them. Well, it was a good one. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Well, well, I don't know. What do you mean, Sean? Uh, say that again. I was, I was drifting. I was just um, when you choose to write in in form, is that something that uh, that just grows out of the subject and uh, the the uh, the thought that that gives birth to a poem to begin with, or it, it, is it grows out of the subject, just as you say? Or even if it doesn't, then it's not going to sound very genuine at all, and no one's going to want to ever recite it again I, you know I wouldn't have if, Hel if Helen's Villanelle imitating or playing off of Elizabeth for one art wasn't really good and clever uh, I wouldn't have remembered it even at all even though I couldn't recite it to you right now but I bet she could <laughs> <laughs> the one thing uh, the one thing that I love about form is that it's generative it's um uh, people often think it's restrictive because you have to meet certain demands of the form. But to me, it makes, it makes me choose words that I would not, not normally in my lazy um, repetition of myself um, opt for. Um, so I find, it, I find it very generative. But of course, uh, Sean and John are absolutely right. The, the, um, the subject must fit the form um, or demand it sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love to play with form, but I, uh, what I'm trying to do more of now is I see if the poem that I'm sitting down to write is naturally leaning into a form. And then if it is, I, I nudge it that direction. Um, I mean, we've all probably been in classes or workshops where we were asked, um, you know, in our early days to, write a sonnet or to write a villanelle. And um, um, so that's, that can be a good practice, but I, I do prefer now um, when I sit down to see where the poem's gonna go and, and, lean, and lean that that way. But I completely agree with you, Cindy. I, I, I can, I, well, two things. I mean, form, I think, can be a wonderful place to pour intense feeling, whether it's grief or sadness or something, because just that vessel that gives you that kind of compression um, can add some power, I think, to a poem. But um, but also the surprise, of it, you know, because you have this, this auditory template lit up. Um, and, and I would often encourage my students to read their poems aloud, not only after they've written them, but while they're writing them. Because you hear that sort of, that auditory template is kind of lit up and, and you can choose words that you would not have expected to choose. Of course, they still have to ask themselves, well, is that the best word to choose? You can't stick it in just for the rhyme. But anyway, it's, um, I think form can be can be great fun. And Sean, I've read many of your poems that have a kind of, that have a kind of formal elegance to them, even though you're not writing in a traditional form. Um, I mean, you have the undergirdings of, um, of the best of what, what good form does, I think. So, um, and I loved, let's see, Sydney, was it you that the play of form and soul, was that your line, I believe? I yeah. love um, Thank you. And Thank I'm you. I'm thinking you probably do feel that even even in translations, and I've never worked in translation, but I imagine that play of form and soul is also very important. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, I was thinking um, earlier uh, regarding a different topic that um, that sometimes writing, I mean, uh, some uh, a writing poet poetry is not therapy. I mean, it can feel therapeutic when you're in a very dark space um, but the poem itself is the more important thing uh, in that in that uh, dynamic um, but it can writing poetry uh, from a dark place can give you a sense of control over over a situation that may may 
feel overwhelming uh, somehow. So I think in that sense, um, it's, it's a, another balm <laughs> to, <laughs> to the difficulties that we... Anne Sexton is great on that topic. If you ever look at some of her interviews or essays, uh, where she talks about the importance of form, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's an importance to her because she couldn't possibly even write about any of those things she was writing about. They were right. so upsetting and personal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On another note, I'm 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 very I admire Helen very much. I have never been able to write a villanelle in my life. <laughs> I've tried many times. They're very difficult. Although I did, I think in my, my new and selected poems, I do have one that I allowed to, mm -hmm. to, be, <laughs> to be seen. But yeah, no, it's, that's, a, that's a difficult form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, unless someone has another question, I guess we will have to wrap it up. I hate to do it. We could talk for a long time. It's such a pleasure to have all of you, all of you with us. Um, and for those of you who've joined us in the audience, we appreciate your, your finding us um, on our Dali YouTube channel. Um, and please tell your family and friends to find us there too. Um, this program will remain up um, and you can just have them Google the Dali Poetry Series, the YouTube channel, and it will come up as well as our former um, programs. Um, but it has been such an honor to have the three of you with us. Again, all of you watching, please go to Tombola Books and, and buy um, these wonderful poets. Um, their books, their most recent books, um, and also their past books. And Alsace Valentine will be happy to help you if you call there too. So uh, we will be back in January. And until then, all of you, please have a safe um, and meaningful holiday season. And thank you so much for joining us in the Dolly Poetry Series. Thanks, John and Sydney and Sean, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. Bye -bye.